you are a child of God and worthy in your own right. Oh, welcome back to Her Standards with me, Queen Tambori. Today I am in the company of an amazing woman. She's the CEO and founder of Breakthrough Leadership Transformation Group, also known as BLT. She's a published author. She's a global leadership coach. Catalyst, yes, and coach. Yes. Mm. Of course, um, I'm holding one of her books here, which I believe will, will, she'll tell us more about it as we come to the end of this show. But before we get there, Patricia, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, are you on social media? Yes, LinkedIn, Dr. Patricia Morogami, Instagram at Pat Morogami, and my website is uh, www.dr for Dr. Patricia Morogami.com. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, as we kick off this part, if you have any questions, you have any comments, um, you have any contribution you want to make on our show today, just hit us up across all social media platforms at KTN Home or at Quintan Board. But of course, you can engage our guest for the day, who is Dr. Patricia Murugami. I think maybe two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, sadly, there was um, an incident that happened on social media where a few women were being accused of um, being toxic or harassing or bullying fellow women at the workplace. Did you hear about it? Yes, in person, yes. Yes. Do you, and and from it, it almost felt like it was perpetuating this age-long uh, perception that, you know, women, we are our own worst enemies. You know, mm. people like feeling that. I don't believe in that myself. No. Yeah. But what did you, what did you make of that incident? Okay. I think that the first and foremost things that you see on social media yeah. is just one side of the story. Yeah. yeah. So no matter how thin you cut it, always check the other side of the story. So that's the first thing. And I found in, in a leadership space, it's so important to be objective, irrespective of how emotive the situation is, to check what's the inner story, what's the inner scope. That's the first. Secondly, this whole idea that women are their worst enemies. I think human beings are their own worst enemies. Let's remove the gender piece. Let's just remove that. And so, because you see, the minute I doubt myself, I'm critical towards myself, then I'm already an enemy towards myself. And unfortunately, I can't give you what I don't have. So if I'm critical towards myself, what do I look at you through? A lens of criticism. In fact, that was my doctoral research. And I was, I was seeking uh, to answer the research question, what are the barriers that hold women back from becoming transformational leaders? See, and I was, you know, it was so exciting, that research, because I had a chance to interview both men and women. And then I had a committee of experts who are seasoned leaders. And what was fascinating is out of the seven areas that could hold people back. The one that is most pervasive, the one that is most intense, that has the biggest impact, is internal barriers. And that's why I'm so excited about the work you're doing through this show and the work we do at Breakthrough Leadership Transformation and our newly launched Rise School, because the work on the inside is where the work is to be done. If we can work on our internal atmosphere and deal with the baggage, the pain, the regrets, the shame, hmm? because we all have that. Even the two of us here, as glam as we may look, we all have it, but we've got to find a way to deal with it and then shed light on how others can deal with those, those challenges. So the internal work is the one that unlocks the internal barriers. My third point around um, this whole thing of um, women being toxic. My, my experience with toxicity is very much born out of pain and insecurity. When I see cultures, and I think many organizations, and sometimes high-performing organizations, the price they pay is that their culture is toxic. So yes, they're growing, they're hitting their budgets and exceeding them. But when you look at the culture, which is really the impact of how they work on the human spirit of the employees, then it's toxic. And why is it toxic? Because it's fueled by a scarcity mentality. The only way I can go up is by elbowing and stepping and leaving dead bodies figuratively behind as I climb up. Another piece has to do with realizing that people think that growth is only one way. And so I go up the ladder. When I get to the top, I throw off the ladder so no one else can come up. Worse still, I jump the elevator so no one else can. It can go back to pick more people. 
as really an, a false and negative way of looking at leadership. But you see, why do people do this? This is, for me, that's always the question. Why would I want to throw off the ladder? Uh, I don't think people really were born nasty. These are learned things, eh? You learn to be nasty, you learn to be toxic, because maybe the environment you're in is pushing you in that direction. When you think of survival, my only way is to cover my back. So then I have to be like that. Or I choose to go against it, which requires so much more energy and effort. See, so toxicity is just an iceberg. What we should be doing is finding out what's really going on beneath the surface. And how can these people be helped? I mean, I've seen a lot of senior women, of course, they're much fewer now, thank God, who would speak like that. But I remember in the beginning, when we started to do the work around raising the leadership temperatures positively uh, within the country a couple of years ago. Men would tell me, I can never put people in an only female program. <laughs> Why? Why are they special? I'll be like, oh, okay. Why are they special? That's a bit of a strange question, but okay. And in five years, they're the ones who are saying, I want an organization-wide female program because 50% of our market, 50% of our employees are unheard, unseen, are invisible. This has to change. Now, my last comment around that analogy. You see, the more we speak about toxicity and negative things, the more they catch on. And the more our younger sisters imagine that every woman is like that. So how about we change the narrative? Mm -hmm. One of the quotes I remember writing some years ago, um, you know, because I read another quote which is the opposite, which I'll not talk about here, yeah. because I think that's just giving it credence. Yeah. But I understand where that, that author was, Madeleine, was coming from. But I changed it and I said, you know what, there's a special place in heaven for women and men who lift others. Be that person. Be that person. Why retreat that story? Why? I have power through my hands. I could say, you know what, there must be another angle. I can choose not to forward that message and change the storyline and maybe see how can we help? How can we ensure that what is going viral is not sticky, negative, toxic stories and instead talk about the positive ones that are elevating the human spirit and that our younger sisters, children, brothers may look out because for many of them, the only teacher they have is the phone. It doesn't matter who else is talking into their lives, that phone is everything. And that is why you're finding mental well-being. If you have a lot of toxicity and negativity, then people feed that, internalize it, and you become what you eat and what you read and what you watch. Yeah, I hope you are listening because um, we need to find silver lining. We yes. need the grey cloud. Absolutely. Every, every, they say every grey cloud has a silver lining. So instead of focusing on the toxicity, what about we pick, what if we picked some positive lessons on some of these things that are happening in, in our environment? How many women, have you, how many lives have you impacted? How many humans <laughs> have, have you impacted through the BLT program? Such a good question. Yeah. Um, I would say directly, must be over 100,000. Indirectly, if each one, each one has a family, it's a ripple effect. I mean, I get calls of spouses telling me, when my wife came through your program, everything changed. Can we pay you more? Can you imagine? Yeah, do you have an advanced class? Do you have something for men? So there's a lot of work, and which is why actually uh, we came up with the Rise School, which is digital. We've pre-shot the videos, done all the content. So wherever you are in the world, because this show goes everywhere, you don't need to feel limited that you can't access breakthrough leadership transformation, and you can't grow and become your next best self. And so I think that the ripple effect, I'll probably never know. And that's okay. I've made peace with that. Some people come back and tell us this is what happened. But for me, it's really the challenge of always showing up fully, irrespective of what may be holding me back, and seeing if our work can breathe life into people from a leadership perspective so that they can lead better. You know, one good leader has such a dramatic effect. I mean, if only as leaders we know how, how impactful, negatively or otherwise, yeah. or positively, yeah. our words, our actions. Yeah. You know, someone somewhere wishes they were you, Quinta. Mm -hmm. Someone somewhere, even if you feel you're not, you're static or you feel you're yeah. not making progress in your yeah. goals, yeah. Someone, someone somewhere yeah. wishes they were you. I think let's never forget that. Okay. Whichever roles we have, mm -hmm. 
that someone somewhere wishes they were us. Mm. And so we've got to sit up a little bit with a bit more courage and yeah. say, you know what, no matter what is pulling me down, yeah. I'll look for a solution and I'm going to rise yeah. and rise beyond the, the, the challenges around me. Rise is the, is the title of your the first, first book. book. Absolutely. And then we have pause. We'll still we'll, we'll pause that. Oh, we'll pause that talk for That's now. That's fine. <laughs> we'll talk about rise and pause later on. But uh, I'm asking you this because um, what amazes you? Your, your program caters for both men and women, right? Yes. What amazes you about the personalities that you have touched their lives? What amazes you about women? What amazes you about oh, men? men? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So let's start with uh, my sisters, yeah? Yes. What amazes me with women is how much power we have and how underrated we are about ourselves. Positive power. Yeah, that's the point. First, you don't know, so you don't even know how to use it. So for me, that's, I always look and I say, if someone has come through our executive coaching, how they came in and how they emerge, um, people coming through our Breakthrough Mastery Circle, which I'm inviting you, Mary did it, and many other leaders, yeah? In fact, now we intend to do a before and after, because I remember in one of the programs, a lady couldn't even stand up and hold the mic. You know, and in media, you know what that means. So it means internally there's a confidence gap, right? Yeah, and the conflict uh, is around, can I really do this? And so then it impacts on the confidence. But for me, I'm never working on confidence, no. I work on, we work on clarity of purpose. If you know why you want to speak, and you're clear about who it's going to help, then you see the courage comes. So then out of clarity of purpose, you have the courage. And once you get the courage, you realize, okay, I need skills here, media training, or leadership training, or leadership coaching, or I need to catalyze my team, then you invest in the competence. And then the confidence comes as a byproduct. I think that this idea of trying to fill the confidence gap without dealing with the underarching issues and uh, reasons for why we want to do what we want to do is short-lived. It doesn't have a very long-term impact. So, um, so for women, that's what has uh, stood out for me. I think another thing around women is the power of how much they're able to do. You know, a woman will show up into a leadership program. She's taking care of, I mean, she's married, she's taking care of children, she has parents a wider community, a team, not to mention the team of her own personal team, PA, maybe house assistant, maybe I don't know who, and a lot of drama going on in the background. And she's like, I'm here now, I'm gonna focus on this. The ability to single task. I think we've got to move away from multitasking to single tasking. And, and I always say, you know what, you have so much strength from other facets in your life. Bring that to the workplace. Don't be diminished because someone gave you a bad review or criticize you don't take it personally look back and see how many other battles have I won and how can I leverage on that experience and bring it to the workplace and vice versa by the way eh? because some people are very strong at work and their personal uh, spaces are not as strong so can I bring those skills those insights that attitude that I bring to projects at work to my project at home you know can I seek advice on a home front, personal front, just like I do for a professional side. I think we sometimes live a dichotomy of lives. So from a female perspective, those are some of the things that, and when they grasp that, the sky is the lower limit, really. Now for men, what has impressed me with men over the last two, three years is that many of them are coming to that awareness that they need to grow. It's true, the leadership rules were written by men. But that doesn't mean that because I wrote the rules as a man, assuming I was a man, that I actually know what those rules mean. By the way, the leadership um, uh, environment has changed. Emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence. There are so many salient aspects that even this pandemic has brought out. The value of empathy, the value of collaboration, crisis leadership, things that most people are just on autopilot, running their businesses, making lots of money. So I have found that men have also come to the realization that it's time to rise, and they're beginning to be humble enough to say, I need that leadership coach. I need, if it's a chief executive with his ex-co, we need to hire Breakthrough or any other you know, leadership catalyst to come in and help us navigate. They are no longer afraid to be vulnerable. I think we've seen a, a significant shift. And I, I would say that they are also self-assured. They are no longer feeling, to a large extent, many of them are not feeling that it's us versus the women. 
they actually some forward-looking CEOs tell me it's wonderful to have an executive team that's 50% women because women bring a very different positive perspective a longevity in terms of thinking about this decision what's the impact in the long term around understanding the demographics of the marketplace so I'm finding that um, men have begun to see that we've got to all be more inclusive and I dare say many of them are seeing it from a legacy perspective because they have children, they have daughters, they have granddaughters and they're like, whoa, this world is not going to cut it for my children. So I've got to play my role in giving a voice to those who are invisible, who are not seen, who are not heard, who many times are the minorities, whether it's female, minorities from an ethnic perspective, education perspective, even ageism, you know, where people are giving opportunities to young people, but the older people who are wise and have a lot to bring to the table are being excluded. So I'm seeing also a real shift towards more inclusive uh, authenticity from male leaders. Looking at some, I want to combine two questions mm -hmm. in one. Please. Because this conversation, I mean, we've had it, and we'll keep having it, about having uh, imbalanced representation of women on boards. Mm. I know that is an area <laughs> that you're, you're particularly, uh, in, you part particularly interested in. So they say that um, in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, Five percent of CEO positions are women. Yes, imagine. Uh, senior management is slightly more, maybe around twenty-three. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to the boards now, uh, it's about fourteen percent. Mm. Yeah. I think the, the number goes, when it comes to board management in Kenya. I think do you, how many how many women chair person of boards? Yeah, I think female ones were two or three. Two. Yeah, on the listed listed on the Nairobi yeah. Securities Exchange. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, what do you think we need to do in order to increase these numbers? I feel like they're yeah. a bit too low. Yeah, they are yeah. low. They are low, especially because at entry point, yeah. it's 50 50. It's 50 50. Yeah, then as yeah. we go up, the funnel narrows down. Exactly. Okay. What do oh, we I love need this question. Oh, there's so much to be done. <laughs> Let me tell you. Oh, this is like another thesis. Okay. But let's see if I can just narrow it down. I think the first thing we need to ask ourselves is do I want to serve or do I want to sit on a board? You know, there's a big difference, eh? Yeah. Sitting on a board is for the cloud. Oh, now I'm on the board of APSA and the board of, I don't know, the Fortune 500 Tesla. I mean, uh, oh my goodness, it's just, no. That is sitting, serving. Do I want to serve on a board? Which means bring my talents, experiences, networks and insights, time, energy, effort to that board, to raise the cause of that board so that for the season I'm serving on that board, it has made milestones forward. So first, intention. Secondly, how do I get onto a Tesla board? I mean, you don't just get onto a Tesla board. You have to start on a pro bono board. Neighborhood associations. They are there doing elections. You don't even show up for the elections. That's a great place to start. Because just there being a chair, treasurer, secretary, just understanding human dynamics is really what a board is, right? So volunteer volunteer in your school board where you went to school go back there and say you know what I see what you're doing is there a possibility that I can serve on your board you see second thing is that people don't ask if you don't ask you don't get raise your hand just look at your network primary school high school university where can I bring in my you're in media that's a, a rare skill that very many boards need media and communications and because of the network, we run a network called the Be A Will Network, Breakthrough African Women Who Are Intentional and Impactful in Leadership. And it started during the pandemic. And what we do is we meet twice on Zoom because we have members from all over the world. And we read a book a month. So first of all, when you are going to serve on a board, you've got to be a reader. There are no two ways about it. You can't just go there and hope, I don't know, some divine illuminations. No, 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 you've got to read those board packs. You've got to know what's happening in the industry, best in case, who's not doing so well, where we are at as an organization. So when you get to the board, you're really adding value. So this network, one of the things we found is some of the boards are coming to me to ask me, we need women with this profile. And I'm so excited because these women, having been part of the network, having gone through the breakthrough programs, are ready. 
Yeah. I know later on we'll probably have a board readiness program. And it'll have two angles, and I think this brings me to my next point. There are a lot of female entrepreneurs, okay, running businesses, formidable businesses, just like I am. I think many times people shy away because they feel they have nothing to, to give. I want to call a call to action for women who are entrepreneurs. Your expertise, your mindset is not like an employee. And so this corporate big boards actually want women like you because you bring in an entirely different perspective. How I think now is nothing like how I thought when I was employed. Because now the buck stops with me. All those lives who are impacted on internally in terms of my team, externally in terms of our clients, is all based on every decision I make. It changes everything. How I look at things is very different. A media opportunity to speak is a great, I will not stammer and stutter and say maybe not, because I can see that this could help someone, you see. So ask for what you need, look around, volunteer, study. So bring in the point around uh, entrepreneurial boards. I also want to encourage entrepreneurs to focus on coming up with at least a board of advisors, even before you get a corporate board, which is like one step. And the, the leadership circle we'll be running later in the year will be about, are you board ready? Or is your company board ready? You know, how can you as a founder start thinking about board readiness? for your own company, but also ask yourself, how can I, as an entrepreneur, serve on other boards? So if we think about it from that angle, we start to open the pipeline. But I find that um, there are a lot of opportunities now, but you find sometimes the same skirts, they're called golden skirts, being taken around from one board to the other. But sometimes when you, when you talk to these golden skirts, they say, I offered the opportunity to her, and so she said no. This other one said no. This other one felt she was not ready. You know, you'll never be as ready as you want. Just get on with it. I think Sheryl Sandberg says, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, don't ask where is the seat. Get on, then figure out where. It's to the rocket, yeah? It's going up, right? So what's this thing of which seat do I want? No, 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 get on. And then ask how and uh, figure out the rest. And I think that's the way the pandemic has taught us. We didn't know how to do things, but we had had to just get on and get on with it. I'm going to switch. We've been, we've been talking, I've been talking very serious issues. Yeah. <laughs> switch a bit. Okay. Um, so that we at least you, you also get to know you more. Yeah. So, where, where, what's your typical day like? Like on a Saturday, 10 a.m., <laughs> where, where, where can you be found? <laughs> That's so fresh. So, a Saturday, 10 a.m.? Or 11, yeah. Yeah. About, yes, Oof. <laughs> Oof. I'm trying to figure out on which Saturday should I speak. Well, um,. So every, every month, I have one Saturday that's dedicated to a personal morning of reflection. Okay. And that for me is fixed. And it's a meditation, a recollection is what I call it. So that's a really important. When I don't have that, I feel I've lost my compass. Yeah? So I was just thinking this last Saturday, I actually chose to do that. But my typical Saturdays, mm -hmm. it's running errands, dropping the kids from one activity to the other, really being a glorified chauffeur. Um, you know, accompanying my husband is like, now I have you today, take me to this project, let's go and look at this. I'm like, I just wanted to sleep, but no, that's, I think we'll sleep one day. So for me, it's very much around uh, more service to my family. Uh, my mom could call me and say, you know what, I need you to come step in and do this for me. So I kind of try and leave it very open. We try very hard not to work on Saturdays unless some corporate really insists that we need to. And I find uh, Saturday mornings are a little more hectic than afternoons. The afternoons tend to now pare down because then um, the morning schedule has, is done. And so now with my, our daughters, we can do something, visit someone, go home and just max, prepare for the week, study, you know. They are at points in their studies that they need a bit more time and focus. And sometimes just me sitting there reading is an example to them. Also an opportunity for me to recalibrate our house processes, yeah. you know, yeah. and probably have a chance to have a conversation with um, a home assistant around menu planning for the week. You know, what do we need to do? What are some things we need to change? Incidentally, that's really an important thing of having a weekly conversation with your house assistant. I think that just as we do with our assistants at work, the house home assistant is such an important person that they, they can't just operate without some clarity and guidance. And I found that makes a big difference because typically our home assistants have stayed with us for many years. 
and the pandemic year of 2020, we had no one. So it made a big difference to recognize the value of not having a home assistant and doing all the work. <laughs> Now, there's, there's a, an American political activist, you probably know her, she's called Angela Yvonne Davis. Mm -hmm. and she's also a philosopher, she's an academic scholar and an author, like you. And she says, I'm no longer accepting things I cannot change. I am changing things I cannot accept. <laughs> so what's, what's, this, what's on your not tolerating list in 2022? What are you not tolerating in 2022? Mm. We're about to finish. Yes, I love the quote. It's such a deep quote, and I agree with it. My non-negotiables are toxicity. Yeah, negativity and toxicity. That's uh, like uncontrollable. You know, there's a space where you can be just down, and people are down around you. But to wallow in it and self-pity, non-negotiable. For me, first, and hopefully that I can influence those around me. We're about to finish. We promise to talk about rice. Pause, what's coming next? Yeah, that's a secret. That's a secret. <laughs> I must say that these books are really born out of people telling me Patricia Wright. So the power of our tongues, you know, sometimes you just need someone to tell you something and you realize. I have a friend in Uganda who long before I wrote the first book, Rise, and she wasn't even close. We had done a lot of leadership work there. Wrote me a WhatsApp and said, hey, how are you doing? She hadn't talked to me for many years, yeah, I think months, and said, I dreamt that you had a book and the bookstores were just waiting. And I was like, what? And you see, so that planted a seed. So I think for me, it's the, the lesson around what do we tell people when you see light in them, don't shut it down, find the light, because that light could come in a show, in writing, and then don't wait. I think this last two years I've taught us, stop procrastinating. In my book, Rise, I talk about the barriers that hold us back. And procrastination is one of the first, in addition to perfectionism. But let me talk about procrastination because everyone here watching this probably has a project that they are waiting for the perfect time. In my first book, Rise, I quote a Bishop Rosie who says, procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God owes you another chance tomorrow to do what you can do today. So for me, Rise was very much about responding to people. Everyone was so down in 2020 with the pandemic. I just felt collectively the human race was slumped down. So maybe I could write a book about helping people rise. And, and I have a four-way four manifesto and in a political, let me clarify what manifesto means here, yes. because in a political year, <laughs> yeah. it's really misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Raise your heart with courage. Raise your head with competence. Raise your hand and with the other hand, lift others with a generosity of spirit. And then raise your entire being for a higher purpose in that order. So to rise, you don't start anywhere. My argument is you start with your heart. And that's how we built the Rise School the masterclass in self-leadership, which is a 12-week program starting next month, that a lot of people have been asking for because they read the book and they're like, so how do we implement this as emotional intelligence, legacy, and all those things? Now, 2021, I'm like, yeah, I think writing the first book was hard. I don't think I want that kind of pressure. And then I, I uh, you know, we had, um, some family members were unwell, so I spent a lot of time in hospital last year. And you know, you sit outside HDU and you even make friends with other families. And I would leave there and I would go to a chapel and I would write my prayer intentions and my quotes and my reflections. And then on, as we came to International Women's Day, uh, 20 days I think before that, I started releasing those quotes on my social media platforms. And someone came and told me, I've been printing them. Yeah, I have another book. I was like, there's another book, Eureka. So as the year wore on, I realized that that is a potential for another book. And so pause, which is really the reason why when you rise, you must pause. You can see the hammock. I'm looking forward to owning a hammock soon. Mm -hmm. But the point is you can't rise without pausing. Good stuff, Patricia. It looks like our time is up. But definitely because of the social media space, this doesn't have to be the end of this conversation. Let's keep talking. 
you can engage Dr. Patricia Murugumo. She's uh, on all social media platforms, but you can also talk to us directly. Uh, how has the show impacted you? And do you have any plans, you know, to transform your life after watching this? Or do you feel that there's somebody who can benefit from the conversation that we've just had? I just want to say thank you so much. I want to conclude with um, a quote. I don't know whether you remember this. This is from yours. Dr. Patricia once said, <laughs> the future is not female. I'm working towards making the future more human and humane, where each person can become their next best self. Let's see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye for now.